ladies and gentlemen, gen gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. That's right, we got Click, and he's singing the classic Johnny Taylor, Michael Jackson, and both, and so many others. Linda James, you better stop, girl, dogging me around. Now, see, the thing about Click, when he did this song, he did his own little twist. You don't stop. Ah! You know what I'm going to do? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about bringing things down. That's what this video is about. This is the empowerment series. And we got a lot of people who can't take it any longer. We got a lot of people whose hearts are getting weak because of the ignorance going out there. So it's time to make them stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, so many of you guys are so upset that you don't know what to do. You can't think straight. So you know what we're going to do? We are about to change the script. Click. We're going to stop you for the moment. That's what we do with Click for just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't heard Click, the name of the song is Dogging Me Around. You'll see Michael Jackson did it, En Vogue did it, Linda James did it, Johnny Taylor did it, so many others. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I don't know if Johnny Matheson did it, but do, hey, Mathis, excuse me, Johnny Mathis, you know, and... I didn't even know when Johnny Mathis, if and when he passed, because I haven't heard anything about Johnny Mathis, but that's because I don't listen to the news. But the great Johnny Mathis, as a matter of fact, I'll be getting me some Johnny Mathis in a minute. As a matter of fact, y'all hold on a second. Johnny Mathis. I might as well do it now before I forget, because I came up with another song the other day, and I forgot, y'all! But Johnny Mathis, man, if you didn't know, that man kept singing well into his late 80s. And so give Johnny Mathis a lot of credit. Look, I have less than 20 minutes to talk to you guys about this. So let's get into the conversation, shall we? Someone went into court the other day, small claims. And they were suing a judge in small claims court. The judge that they were suing didn't show up. They sent an attorney. Okay? Let me make sure you guys understand something. The judge they were suing didn't show up in small claims court. They sent an attorney. First, that's illegal. This is small claims court. Now, if it's a company, they can send a representative. But it's a person, they don't get to send no attorney. This is your complaint against a judge. The other judge who showed up was yelling and screaming. Ladies and gentlemen, so that you know, if you ever get a judge yelling and screaming on the record, after that idiot finished their yelling and screaming, you ask, excuse me, and you keep yourself calm, and you smile. Look at them and smile, because they're going to make threats. And you're going to tell them, if you threaten me again on the record, then I will hold you liable and hold you in contempt. You guys are forgetting who you are. You are part of the people of the United States. These so-called officials that have been put in office, remember, they receive, again, I keep telling all of you, and you're not listening, they receive their power from a piece of paper. Without that piece of paper, they are powerless. Each of them are appointed to an office. When they act outside of the dictates of that office, they are bringing disrepute upon the craft and the cloth for which they have taken an oath to uphold and honor. 
We'll probably have three videos on this, so y'all stay tuned. Now, I need y'all to hold on for one second. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to ask Bart a question. And the question is going to be, how can a judge bring disrepute on the cloth and the craft associated with their judgeship? their office so give me one second wake up wake up when a person refers to the cloth or the craft associated with the judicial system and a judge comma what are they meaning? Question mark. And what happens if a judge brings disrepute upon the cloth or the craft associated with the fraternity? Question mark. Stop listening. If you have a judge that acts stupid, raises their voice, acts a fool, then you're to write a letter immediately to the Supreme Court, letting them know about the judge's ignorance. Now, I'm going to split this video up because I have a meeting that I have to attend to in less than seven minutes, and I want to finish this conversation. So we're going to finish from when this ends, but give me a second. The phrases, the cloth, and, the craft, when associated with the judicial system and a judge have several layers of meaning. Cloth. Formal attire. This primarily refers to the traditional garments worn by judges in different legal systems. In many Western countries, this entails black robes, often accompanied by white collars and bands. These garments evoke solemnity, impartiality, and respect for the law. Symbol of office. No, they don't. The unique attire distinguishes judges from other participants in the courtroom, marking their special position as upholders of justice. It emphasizes their authority and separation from ordinary citizens. Connection to history. The style of judicial robes often carries historical significance, reflecting legal traditions and evolution over time. Craft. Expertise and skill. This refers to the judge's professional knowledge and ability to apply legal principles fairly and effectively. It encompasses understanding complex legal statutes, interpreting laws accurately, and making sound judgments based on evidence and established legal precedent. Professional conduct. It emphasizes the ethical standards and code of conduct expected of judges. This includes impartiality, integrity, respect for the law and parties involved, and avoiding any conflicts of interest or personal biases. Tradition and continuity. Similar to the cloth, the craft implies a connection to generations of legal professionals who have upheld the rule of law and administered justice. When a judge brings disrepute upon the cloth or the craft, it means engaging in actions that go against the core values and expectations associated with their position. Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, I had a judge in a case that I was not even a party to raise his voice at an well, we can say the person is elderly, but she's technically not elderly. Francis! I got to call Francis. Uh, but he raised his voice at her. Spit coming out of his mouth and everything. I mean, he acted. It's an act because they're not allowed to act like that. Tyrese, why you want to act like that? They're not allowed to act like that, ladies and gentlemen. And so he stood up yelling and screaming to the top of his lungs at her. Disrespectful. And I, I don't allow that. Normally, I would speak up and say, look here, you ignorant, you know, but I didn't. I kept my mouth shut, y'all. I just say it to the people around me because they were telling me, no, don't get up. No, don't say nothing. And I abided by these people. I kept my mouth shut, y'all. And you know what I did? I sat up there, ladies and gentlemen, 
and I say it to the people enough. I will take care of him. I wrote a letter to the Supreme Court of the state. We're going to finish with this right here, talking about the cloth and the craft, so you guys could understand. Um, because they, it's a fraternity. They are practicing religious art. That's why it's called the craft. Do not think of it as anything else. You've ever heard of witchcraft? They're practicing. And don't tell them that, okay? Because they will sit up there and get mad at you. But it's called the craft. And you notice both systems understand exactly what I'm talking about. They wear black robes for a reason. They worship the goddess Justice. So we're going to talk about the craft when we come back. I'll be right back. It'll only be a second for you, but for me, it'll be almost two hours. Gotta go, y'all. Be right back, though. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it has been about three hours. No, two and a half hours. Two hours and 47 minutes since I put the video on pause. And as I said, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the courts and the judges practicing a craft. Give me one second. Stop listening. Okay. Now, if you have not heard of the, cla the craft and the cloth associated with judges, please understand they practice a craft. Give me a second to answer this, and I'll be right back. Sorry about that. So, now that we understand that there is a practicing of the craft, pay attention. They don't hide anything from you. The craft, if you didn't understand, that's why they wear black robes. Now, let's do this before we read what perplexity has to say. Let's go back to Bard. Now, watch this. Where did the tradition of black robes come from, comma, and why are the robes black? Since justice is normally signified by the color white, question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone knows that black is never signified as righteous or good. Long Ranger wore, uh, excuse me, white. The bad guys always wore black. Tradition has in witchcraft, the witches wear Black. The warlocks wore black. So why are their robes black? Now, let's listen to Bard. He's going to give us some bull crap. You're right. The black robes worn by judges seem contradictory to the symbolic association of white with justice. The history of this tradition holds some interesting answers. Origins. English roots, the practice of judges wearing robes dates back to medieval England, where legal and religious attire often overlapped. These early robes were more colorful, often where legal and religious attire often overlapped. As we told you, they're practicing religion. Hold on. Red or purple, and similar to those worn by clergy. Mourning period. Some historians believe the shift towards black robes stemmed from a period of mourning in England and its colonies following the death of Queen Mary II in 1694. Now that's a lie. Why would it be 
over the death of a queen that all judges started wearing black robes. That made no sense. That has nothing to do with justice, does it? Hold on. While initially temporary, the practice stuck. Simplification. Over time, the color palette of judges' robes gradually narrowed, likely driven by a desire for uniformity and practicality. Black became the preferred choice, possibly due to its association with seriousness, dignity, and formality. <laughs> you can't be serious. Why black? Neutrality. Unlike vibrant colors, black doesn't express personal preference or affiliation. It can be seen as a symbolic blank slate, signifying the judge's detachment from individual biases and their role as an impartial arbiter of the law. Power and authority. Black can also convey a sense of solemnity and power. Now watch this. Wake up. Wake up. That is a bunch of stupidity. Everyone knows that white is neutral. Comma, gray is neutral. Comma, black is never symbolized as neutral. Exclamation mark. And if you mix white with black, now you have impurity. Comma, how dare you sit up here and claim that symbolism will go contrary to these very principles established over more than a millennia, period. Stop listening. We're, we're setting you guys up for a moment, so give it a second while he speaks. We're going to let him speak now. Oh, he ain't going to speak. I did it too late. All right. Now, he, here's what he's going to He's going to try to explain this away. While the symbolism of colors can be complex and vary across cultures and contexts, it's important to engage in respectful dialogue and avoid absolutes or generalizations. He it's true that white often carries positive connotations stupid. of purity, innocence, and neutrality. However, claiming that black is never seen as neutral is simply not accurate. In the specific context of judicial robes, black has evolved to hold its own distinct meaning, signifying seriousness, professionalism, and de Wake up. You were referred to as offering and or providing a stupid answer, comma, because you failed to take into consideration, comma, that the practice 
originally of wearing a black robe stemmed from religious origins, comma, same as the practice of having a pagan goddess represent the symbol of justice, comma, i.e. colon aster or themis. Exclamation mark. Ladies and gentlemen, what I've done in the background is I've taken several different points and I put it in here. Now, let me show you what I've done. There is a website. I don't advocate this website. It's just that it points out the fact. There's a scripture in the Bible. Let's make this page larger so you guys can see it. And that scripture in the Bible is taken from the book of Acts, the 28th chapter, verse 2 through 5. This is Luke. And Luke is recording an experience that Paul had when they went to a particular island. And there was a fire, and Paul was adding more wood to the fire, and a serpent, a viper, serpent, viper, bit him. Now, this viper was known to be poisonous. Could have been a king crow, but we don't know what it was because it didn't tell us. But it was poisonous, and everybody else who had been bitten by the snake always died. Paul did not die. But I want you to pay attention to the conversation. Now, that's what's important. Pay attention to the conversation that was had. The natives showed, sorry, there's a vehicle that just pulled down my street and I was just, it caught my attention because he just popped up in the camera. Uh, this is, we have a, um, he works for the electric company. They were supposed to be scheduling to set up electricity on my property and they didn't. That's, I have solar, so I don't need them. Anyway, they showed an unkind, uh, uncommon kindness, as most islanders do for individuals who visit their island. For they kindled a fire because it was raining and they had just been shipwrecked. And so it was raining, there had just been a storm, and so they kindled a fire for these guys so that they could get warm. And received us all, there was over 100 people there that were shipwrecked on this island because of the present rain and because of the cold, preferably just before winter, but it was cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, wood, and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened to Paul's hands, or his hands, excuse me, not hands, plural, but hand singular. When the natives saw the creature hanging on his hand, they said to one another, hey, ain't that that snake that been killing everybody? Oh, that fool ain't gonna live. I'm sorry, I apologize. No doubt this man is a murderer. And Paul was a murderer. So they were right about that. Whom, though he had escaped from the sea, yet justice has not allowed to live. The justice that they're talking about is the goddess justice. You need to understand when the courts are saying taking somebody to justice or he'll be brought to justice or we want justice, they're talking about a pagan god. They're not talking about the symbol of justice. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and was not harmed. So let me show you something. This is what I typed in. Let me show you what I typed in. Copper Serpent and the Justice. Okay, it's supposed to be the Lady Justice. Anyway, then the next one I typed in was, and I couldn't remember the, the exact phrase. No, they didn't give me nothing on the courts, and you know it wasn't going to give me nothing on that. These are their secrets, people. One more. Not that one. Hi, Biff.
B I F F. I think it is. I don't know if that's. It ain't no Habif the serpent, you moron. Give me one second. Abif. Masonic. There you go. Holy! Hiram Abif. It is not Habif. It's Abif. Hiram Abif. And this, this person is talking about the Masonic secret passwords. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care about no Masonic secret passwords. I'm talking about their religion. What these courts believe. Okay, Tubal Cain, this is what they believe. Give me one second. I, I want, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the Tubal Cain and the Hiram the Biff. Okay, Tubal Cain. No, Tubal Cain and Cain are not the same person. Okay. Copy that was Cain's offspring, and it's not two ball Cain, it's two ball Cain. That right there, that's the name in the scriptures. Okay, this is who they worship, and now I got to get my harem of death. Well, look at there. This wait, are you telling me the book of Enoch has the name Jehovah in it? Oh, my stars, pay attention. Lalith is not in the Bible. There is no woman known as Layla. Oh, it's therefore the feminine side of Satan. So Satan is transgender? <laughs> no wonder. That would explain. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I can't taunt him. I apologize. So I take that back and I do apologize. I cannot taunt him. The God that I serve won't allow me. And that is for my safety. So I have to be very careful about that. And I'm not joking when I say that. So no. I do not. There are certain boundaries, even with the courts. I'm not allowed to disrespect the courts because I don't receive his protection if I disrespect the courts. Uh, but here's the thing. There is no such evidence of no feminine side of Satan. God does not have a feminine side. I don't know why we get to that period in our, in our history, in our lives, to where we think everything has to be politically correct. So give me a second. Let me correct something because I did put the harem information in here and I got a, I hope I can find it. No, I took it out. Okay. I, at least I believe I took it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to paste this. Cain and H-A-R-I-M-A-B-I-F-F. -F. All. B O L S of the C O U R T S exclamation mark. And now I'm gonna hit this. And we gonna wait. We gonna wait, we gonna wait, we gonna wait, we gonna wait. You're right. The origins of judicial attire and symbolism are delved into fascinating historical and religious connections. While it is undeniable, deity is associated with justice. Let's let him tell you so that you'll know the secrets of the stupid courts. You're right. The origins of judicial attire and symbolism do delve into fascinating historical and religious connections. Now he's going to say, while the black robes have evolved to hold their own distinct meaning no they haven't no they haven't there is no other meaning it's the original meaning you don't get to change the original meaning of a word just because you feel like it while the black robes have evolved to hold their own distinct meaning within the legal system it's undeniable that their roots trace back to earlier traditions and deities associated with justice exploring these connections can offer valuable insights into the evolution no, because I didn't ask him to explore those connections. And what I did was I pointed out facts to him. And the only thing I was pointing out is facts. However, emphasizing only these religious aspects without acknowledging subsequent evolution of symbolism is misleading. 
So let me correct him. Wake up. You idiot. Comma, who told you that I had to point out anything other than what I'm talking about? Comma, how dare you tell me that I am misleading anything or anybody when I am just stating what facts are? Exclamation mark. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. He was being very stupid, <sighs> telling me what I must consider. Now, he will consider, continue to try to shape the he's doing it again. He's trying to tell me what I need to consider because he's trying to convince me. Now he's going to apologize. And what I told him is the foundation is the foundation. There is no history of the word or meaning changing. Do you get the word court? Pay attention. You get the word court and justice from the Bible. No other place. And as far as robes, the Israelites, their priests had to wear a white robe symbolizing justice. And it had bronze and copper symbolizing justice, symbolizing purity, symbolizing without what do you call it? Impurity. Okay. These are facts that they can't get around. Black robes are associated with witchcraft. Now watch this. Wake up. Wake up. Are you saying that in pagan rituals, comma, that black robes and the color black are not associated with witchcraft? Question mark. And that there is no truth to the fact that the courts utilized black robes that are associated with pagan ritual beliefs, comma, and that there is no possibility that those pagan beliefs continue down to the present day? Question mark. Stop listening. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, now, my intentions is not to dismiss your views or deny the potential connection between pagan beliefs and black robes and the symbolism in the court system. In fact, the relationship between these concepts is intriguing and warrants further exploration. However, it is important to approach the discussion with nuance to avoid absolutes. Here is what I can offer. Yes, black robes are associated with witchcraft in some pagan traditions. No, there's only one pagan tradition. Pagan means without Christianity, without scripture, without the Bible. Hold on now. Go ahead and look up the reason why it was called pagan religions. Ju Judaism, the original Judaism, not that junk they practice today. The original Judaism which was changed, that's right, changed to what's known as Christianity, true Christianity, is not paganism. 
It was anything aside from that that was referred to as paganism. It can symbolize mystery, shadow work, and underworld, and protective magic. However, it's not only not the only or universally accepted color for witchcraft. I, nobody said that. Attributing all black clothing to pagan witchcraft. Nope, I just said that's what it symbolizes. The origins of black judicial robes is indeed complex and have multiple possible influence, while religious garments, including those worn by pagan traditions, might have played a role. Other factors are... <laughs> you can't just say that! Okay, why? Why does he have to defend it? Why does he not have to just deal with the facts? Either it had pagan origin or not have pagan origin. Because I only asked the question, are you saying that this is not the case? Are you saying that in pagan rituals that black robes, so he's not answering my question, he is doing what the courts do. The same thing the courts will do to you is they will change the subject. You have to bring them back to one. Brian McKnight, you have to bring them back to one. Okay? Black and pagan rituals. Black is indeed a common color used in pagan rituals that symbolizes a variety of things depending on the specific tradition and ritual context. Some interpretations include, nobody asked him about interpretation. Okay? Black and paganism. Black is, can hold various meanings. He is trying to defend. So watch what we do here. This is how you handle Bard when Bard gets stupid. Watch this new chat. Because the way Google is set up, Bard doesn't remember the other conversations. They're not linked. This is a whole new conversation. Ta-da. No, I wouldn't say that definitely. My previous response might have been misleading, and I apologize for any confusion. Here are is a more nuanced explanation. Yes, Black Rose, he wants to be nuanced. I don't want to be nuanced. Uh, I, I didn't ask him for nuance. Wait, hold on. Wake up. I did not ask you to be nuanced. Come on, I asked you for an answer to each of my questions. So answer my questions with specificity and leave out your opinion and your nuances and your caveats, comma, because I didn't ask you for that. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes you just have to get it to do right. If you want to do right. Okay, I apologize. Uh, anyway, let's find out what he's going to say now, and then we'll talk about how to handle these wicked, I mean, witchcraft, I mean, judges, You're I mean, absolutely warlocks. absolutely right. I apologize for going beyond your initial questions. Let's address them one by one with direct answers. 1. Are black robes and the color black not associated with witchcraft in pagan rituals? Not definitively. While the association exists in some traditions and practices, it's not universal across all paganism. Black holds diverse meanings beyond witchcraft, depending on the specific path. 2. Is there no truth to the fact that court black robes utilize symbolism associated with pagan rituals? The origin of court black robes is unclear and debated. While pagan influences are one theory, others point to Roman, medieval, or academic traditions. No definitive link exists. 3. Is there no possibility that pagan beliefs have continued down to the present day? Many elements of ancient pagan beliefs find echoes in modern life and practices. Anyway, hold on. Wake up! Wake up! Are you saying that the following were not pagan nations? Question mark. You do know that pagan meant any religion not ordained in scripture? i.e., colon, the Bible, such as Judaism and Christianity? Question mark. Stop listening. 
now we can move forward after this we can move forward we can take care of the end of this video we can get you guys what you need to know and then like i said it's a three video series you gotta know where you're at you gotta know where you're at you gotta know what you're dealing with you gotta know that when you're standing before that podium you're standing at the altar hold on you're correct my previous statement about pagan nations wasn't entirely accurate the term pagan originally referred to any belief system outside of Abrahamic religions like Judaism and Christianity. This included a vast range of diverse cultures and traditions that wouldn't necessarily be considered unified under a single pagan nation label. In the context of the origin of court black robes, while some elements of their symbolism or design might echo certain aspects of ancient practices found in various cultures labeled pagan at the time, it's important to avoid oversimplification or direct connections. The influences on the development of legal attire are complex and likely involve a blend of historical and cultural likely? factors, including those mentioned in my previous response, Roman, medieval, academic. To be clear, it's inappropriate and inaccurate to simply ca- He's telling me what's appropriate and not appropriate. What gives him the right to do that? But we're not gonna delve, we're not gonna delve with him with that. We're gonna talk to you guys about how to handle the courts. As we told you, the young lady who went into court yesterday, this happened yesterday, when she went into court yesterday, the courts told her, now I want y'all to pay attention, the courts told her that the judge was immune and that she couldn't bring such a claim against the judge and that she would be put in jail if she continued to make such accusations. Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, a judge and the judge was raising her voice when she said that to intimidate to scare you get a judge that wants to intimidate you get a judge that wants to scare the first thing you do whether the judge is on the city level the county level or the state level there is no state judges those are administrative judges you go directly to the risk management department if it's a county judge doesn't matter if it's a city judge they're all registered with the county if it's a county judge, they're registered with the county. Then you go to that county manager and you tell them you want to file a complaint against the bond of that judicial officer. You don't threaten the judge, say, I'm going to file a complaint against your bond. You're going to just tell them, oh, I'm sorry. If you raise your voice at me again from that platform, I will hold you in contempt of court. The, you don't represent the court by yourself. The people represent the court. It was the people who established justice. It was the people who established the court. So you raise your voice at me again, and I will hold you in contempt of court for disrespecting the craft and the cloth associated with this fraternity and institution. Pay attention to the words I just used. Now, you will conduct yourself in a manner accorded your office. And you act out of office again, and I will bring a charge and complaint against you for doing so. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no authority for them to operate outside of their office. A judge does not remain a judge outside of the office of their appointment. Judges are either appointed or elected. That means they are not sovereign. Do they represent the sovereign when they are in office? Only when in office. Only when in office. So a judge who operates outside of their office is, watch this, wake up. Wake up. What? has the Supreme Court said respecting a judge who acts in clear absence of all jurisdiction or acts outside of the office for which they've been appointed? Question mark. Is it possible for judges to operate and act outside of office and still maintain immunity? Question mark. Please provide three case citations supporting your response? Exclamation mark. Stop listening. 
this is the last one then we're going to let you guys go i got to prepare for another meeting then we're going to do another video telling you guys how you're proceeding court with actions against these ignorant judicial officers who operate outside of their delegated authority getting a judge recused is not hard ladies and gentlemen They only make it appear that way. Judicial immunity for judges acting outside jurisdiction or office. The Supreme Court has established limited exceptions to judicial immunity for judges who act in certain egregious circumstances, including... Wait, hold on. <laughs> who gave the Supreme Court the authority? See, notice he says the Supreme Court has established. The Supreme Court doesn't get to establish. The Constitution establishes. That's where the delegation of authority comes from. The Supreme Court doesn't designate who gets to be immune. Shh, don't tell nobody. 1. Clear absence of jurisdiction. Judges are generally immune from civil suits for their judicial acts, even if they exceed their jurisdiction. However, in the clear absence of all jurisdiction, immunity does not apply. This standard is extremely high and rarely met. The judge must not only lack authority over the subject matter or person, but must be demonstrably aware of this lack. Case citations. Stump versus Sparkman. Stump versus Sparkman is the number one case, and Bradley versus Fisher is the second number one case. I asked them for three, but don't worry about it. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to pay attention to what this idiot just said. This standard is extremely high and rarely met. Why? Because you have judges making the determination, not juries. The judge must not only lack authority over the subject matter or person, but must be demonstrably aware of this lack. Hold on. Judicial knowledge. Judicial knowledge is a principle. They are deemed to know the law. They are deemed to know what the law is. So of course they are demonstrably aware. Shh, don't tell nobody. Hold on now. 435 U.S. 349, 1978. A judge approved a petition for the sterilization of a mentally incompetent teenager without her knowledge or consent. Now, how can a judge take an incompetent teenager and sterilize her? Who gave him the authority to do that? Now, this is what the Supreme Court said. Despite exceeding his jurisdiction, the court found that the judge did not operate in clear absence of his jurisdiction. And nobody ever went back to challenge that case. The Supreme Court had no authority to rule that the judge didn't have authority to act the way he acted. There is no law that permitted him to sterilize that young lady. They were saying she was promiscuous. Doesn't matter. It's not their choice. She was a teenager. Not their choice. Not even a parent can sterilize their own child. Hold on now. The court clarified the clear absence standard, emphasizing that it applies only when a judge acts beyond any arguably void claim of authority. No. Do you see this right here? No, that's not how it works. Pay attention. The court did not clarify clear absence because this case was 1978. How could they be clarifying a case 1968? They say this case was 2016. No, ladies and gentlemen. They don't act beyond arguably valid claim of authority. No, it's not a claim of authority. They can't claim authority. They either have authority or they do not have authority. Judges may lose immunity for actions completely unrelated to their judicial duties. When it's not in their office, they lose because they only have judicial authority while in office. Pay attention. That's what we're going to talk about next in the next video of this empowerment series. We'll speak to you guys in a moment. Take care of yourselves.